الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل الصلاة وتم تسليم على سيدنا مولانا وحبيبنا وقضاء أعيننا سيدنا محمد النبي الأمي وعلى آله وصحبه أزواجه وذرياته ومن اهتدى بهذه اليوم الدين تركنا الحجة البيضاء ليلها كنهارها لا يزيل عنها إلا هالك ثم أما بعد So first of all uh, I'd like to welcome everyone back after we had a two week break for the Eid um, and I'm very appreciative of everyone who came out tonight and all those many other things people could be doing on a Friday night but as we discussed the last time when Sheikh Muhammad uh, was here we're living in a time period now <coughs> where much of the essence of our deen, of what we think to be Islam, uh, is lost or we're losing much of it. Because right? there's, there's a form, there's an outer form to things, and then there's an essence. There's a qishra, the shell, and then there's a lub, which is the essence of things. So if you only look at the qishra, you only look at the shell, you'll see people praying, you'll see people going to masajid, you can see the guma is full. You'll see uh, many women uh, dressing uh, hijab and men wearing, uh, you know, so-called Islamic clothing and so forth. But if you scratch the surface and you go beyond the shell and you look to the essence or the lobe, you may be disappointed in what you find, right? Because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he didn't come to change people's outer forms. He didn't come to make the less handsome man a more handsome man nor did he come to make the less beautiful woman a more beautiful woman from the outside but rather from the inside so his uh, focus right was the qulu or the hearts and that's ultimately what the deen is about it's about changing hearts not about changing the outer forms of things and uh, we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't look to our outer forms Right, and I am doing a surah, but I can be able in a kuluvah. He looks to our hearts, and even you know the uh, surah al Hajj, the Rabiha that some of us did last week for Eid al Adha and al Hiya. Right, it's blood, nor will we reach Allah subhanahu wa taala, but rather it's taqwa minkum, but I can taqwa minkum. So taqwa, again, it's a state of the heart. It's not an outward thing. Right, you can't look at someone and say, "For then I taqwa." You have to uh, discern by the interaction with them and you can see by their behavior whether there's a level of taqwa there. But ultimately taqwa is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which is a, a greater realization, a greater understanding of al-mawla azza wa jal that lends you, that informs you in everything that you do. right? Not just in your ibadat not just in how you interact inside the masjid or you interact on uh, Islamic holidays, but rather how you deal with everything that you do. And we, we live in a crisis time. You know, it, it's unfortunate in this country that Eid al-Adha has become synonymous with taharraj uh, al jinsi or sexual harassment of young girls who want to go walking in the streets. And they, they avoid it for Eid, the Zet, because that's when they're more apt to, to get harassed. So obviously something's wrong. Obviously something of the heart, something of the tarbiya, something we're not practicing Islam in the way that we should be. One of the steps that we can take to, to remedy that obviously is to remedy ourselves first. Right? Is to work on ourselves, our own inner states. And people traditionally, whether we're talking about today or even centuries or years ago, they don't change by things that you really say. Right, you can try to convince someone of an argument, you can yell, you can shout, you can smile, but ultimately it's your state, your hal, your mu'amala, right, your khuluq, that's going to change someone else. That's more convincing. Right? The, the Arab, they say, uh, Perhaps the, the, the tongue of your hal, right, the eloquence of your state, is more eloquent than your tongue could be. Right? And the Prophet said he described people who have eloquence in tongue, right? In the bayan the sihra. Right? And this is the eloquence of the tongue. The bayan, there is a sihra, there's a type of magic. Right? And sihr magic is something that move, it's not mahmood. Something that's condemnable. When it's used in a way to 
to uh, allure people to things that are not commendable, then it's a type of magic. And uh, rather the dayan of the heart, right, that brings people to you or brings people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's the true dayan, that's the true ibdal, that's the true message when you send it. And you can't lead people from your heart unless you yourself are speaking with your heart. Right? They say that uh, that which has left only from the tongue will no go will go no further than the ears, and that which has gone out from the heart will penetrate <coughs> the hearts. And so, to have a penetrating heart, another heart that penetrates others, you yourself must be penetrated. You yourself must be effective. You yourself must inculcate this particular hal and state of knowing the deen not only by its forms, but by its essence, by its law. And the best example that we have, obviously, for that is the Prophet ﷺ himself. The best example in all things. And the book that we're reading, hopefully that Allah SWT will give us tawfiq uh, in finishing it, Kitab uh, al Imam al goes through the attributes, both the physical attributes, as well as the uh, non-physical or intangible attributes of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, other characteristics, the way he was, his character, the way he, was, he treated his wives, the way he treated his children, the way he treated people he didn't know, how he spoke to people, how he sat, how he ate, how he drank, things like this. So all of these are, are chapters within the Shema'il and we started last week, uh, beginning with uh, Sifat and Khalqiyah or those attributes that are the physical outer attributes. And we mentioned last week, for those who were, weren't here, and as a reminder for those who were, that there is no singular person in history, period, that we know more about than the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right? Uh, no one can claim that we know more about Isa or Jesus Christ Alayhi Salam than we know about Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We don't. Not even the Christians who claim to know him don't know more about him than we do, than we know about our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because we have a perfect record a recording of most of what he did, how he acted, how he even spoke, right? How he read the Quran, uh, how his hand gestures were and his hand movements when he was speaking, what clothes he used to wear, uh, the things that he used to eat, the things he didn't like to eat, even those type of things that we call uh, jibilla or intrinsic characteristics. We know that about him as well from from uh, the people who were around him, his companions, who we call Sahaba and also from his wives, uh, particularly those things of the matters inside the house that only they would know about. So we have started last week, I think we were the first five or six hadith, if I'm not mistaken, dealing with um, the physical attributes of the Prophet Sallallahu So we start with the seventh. Those of you who have a book, I believe it's page nine, if I'm not mistaken. So just a reminder, we were going to read the full hadith in Arabic, but I will explain as best I, as I can the, the meanings in English and some commentary on the hadith and we will we'll proceed in that particular manner. قال الإمام رحمه الله حدثنا أحمد بن عبدة الضبية البصري وعلي بن حجر وأبو جعفر محمد بن الحسين وابن أبي هليمة والمعنى واحد أو المعنى واحد قالوا حدثنا عيسى بن يونس عن عمر بن عبد الله مولى رفة قال حدثني إبراهيم بن محمد من ولد علي بن أبي طالب رضي الله عنه قال كان علي إذا وصف رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال لم يكن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم بالطويل الممضط ولا بالقصير المتردد وكان ربعة من القوم لم يكن بالجعد القطة ولا بالصبت كان جعدا رجلا لم يكن بالمقصم ولا بالمكثف وكان في وجهه تدوير أرض المشرق أدعج العينين أهدم الأشفار جيل المشاش والكتب أو الكتب أجرد ذو مصربة شثم الكفين والقدمين إذا مشى تقلع كأنما ينحط في صدب وإذا التفت التفت معا بين كتفيه خاتم النبوة وهو خاتم النبيين أجود الناس صبرا وأصدق الناس لهجة وأجنهم عريكة وأكرمهم عشرة من رآه بديهة هذا 
ومن خالفه معرفة أحبه يقول ناعث لم أرى قبله ولا بعده مثله صلى الله عليه وسلم. When this is narrated by himself, he said, Nabi for Sunan and by Haqi for Shu'ah, with the name. So, here we have this hadith, the Sahaba that's narrating it is Ali ibn Abi Talib, uh, or one of the children of Ali ibn Abi Talib, not from Fatima, but from the wife that he married afterwards, Muhammad al Hanifiyya. And he said that if Ali or his father were to describe the Prophet وسلم, he would describe him in this way. And as we've seen in the hadith before, the way that the Arabs used to describe things is usually they give you a balance between two extremes. Uh, and that's a particular thing that you find um, repeated in the way that many of the ulama speak and write about attributes in particular. Whether it be a physical attribute or whether it be a character attribute, it will always be something you have two extremes. So you have very tall and then you have very short. And then you have something in between that's not at either extreme. And you can have someone who's um, very generous or too generous and someone who's very stingy. And then you have something in between. You can have someone who's too courageous, which would be reckless. And then you can have someone who has, doesn't have any courage at all, which would be cowardice. And then you have courage, real courage, which is somewhere in between. So the same for the uh, the physical attributes. right? In the Arab, they say, Sometimes you can't know a thing unless you know its opposites. right? You can't really know what black is unless you know what white is. You don't know what tall is unless you know what short is. And that's the nature of, of many attributes. So here we see he's doing the same thing. So he says in the first line, لم يكن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم بالطويل الممضد ولا بالقصير المتردد. Right. So here he was neither uh, too tall, and we'll see that uh, many of these hadith have what we call alfaz gariba, or not strange words as one would like to translate them, but words that are uh, used uh, very sparingly in the Arabic language. And it's a whole science or discipline called Gharib al-Alfaz. And you find many of the, uh, the ulama they wrote about Masan Gharib al-Hadith. They'll talk about the, the words or the mustalahat in the hadith that are not well known. Or Gharib al-Quran, which is much less obviously in Gharib al-Hadith. And so you find that the uh, the, uh, the amount of Arabic, actually, just on a side note, you know, the number of roots, uh, root words in the Quran, right, because the Arabic language is primarily made of three letter roots. So when I say anima, uh, to know, to know, that's a, a three letter root, and from there you can get ya'lamu wa ya'lamuna wa huwa a'lamu kada. So all of these are derived from that same three letter root, or hatta alnama which is now a fourth letter added, makes it Nadeeb, but they all derive from that triliteral root, as it's called, or in Mujahid al And so the number of those root words in the Qur'an, the ulama say they don't number more than about 1,800 or so. 1,800 of these in the Qur'an. And then uh, in the Hadith, they are somewhat more than that. And the number in the language itself numbers in the tens of thousands, 80 or 90,000. So it's a very, very small subset of that that's actually used in the, the text that, that we need to read. And I'm saying this because this is a way for those who, who want to be encouraged to learn the Arabic. The Arabic that you need for to actually read and understand the Quran is not that much compared to how much is in, in the language itself. Uh, so you find in these hadith, you find words that are gharib or that are not that used. And then we read the narrator of this hadith, you'll find in the later section, which I should have read with this, he gives a meaning, he describes the meanings of some of these words that are not very well used. And amongst them, he says, المضرد, <laughs> So Abu Isa, who is the Imam al who, who compiled this book, 
he thought it, that it was necessary to give the definitions of some of these words. Because even in his time, which is only a few generations removed from the Prophet Sallallahu these words were, were not that well known. So, الطويل المضط يعني المفلت في الطول or someone who is extremely tall. So he, no, he was neither extremely tall ولا القصير المتردد nor was he extremely short. Right, and the word متردد he says here الدافل بعضه في بعض قصرا like you can't tell where his neck starts and where his limbs begin because it's kind of all put together. So there's taraddud, in other words, there's a doubt about how tall they are, how short, and so forth. So he wasn't too short, nor was he too tall. And the other hadith told us, But he was closer to tallness, uh, obviously for Arabs, not uh, for other ethnic groups who are, can be much taller. But for Arabs, he was closer to being tall than he was to being short. وكان رابعة من القوم right والرابعة والمربوعة بمعنى which means that he was of medium build and size for his people لم يكن بالجعد القطة ولا بالصلت right and here it's describing his hair as we mentioned before الجعد القطة which means very curly hair very uh, wiry hair so he didn't have that ولا بالصلت nor was it very fine كان جعدا رجلا right but rather his hair was somewhat wavy but fine in the sense that it could be combed and we'll see in some of the hadith that come later how the Prophet ﷺ would comb his hair on occasion so if it was wet or something he would split it in, in the middle he would part it in the middle so he would have like part on this side and part on that side and sometimes he would let it just come down on his forehead and there's more description of his hair that's going to come later on. So his hair wasn't too curly that he couldn't comb it like in that manner, nor was it too fine that it would just by naturally by itself come down finally. لم يكن بالمطهم ولا بالمكلفم Right, and the Imam Abu Isa he says, المطهم فالباد الكثير اللحم والمكلفم المضور الوجه So the المطهم means someone who is like closer to obesity than to a normal state, to a normal build. So he wasn't that. Nor was he a mukalta, someone who had too round a face. But his face was somewhat rounded. So it wasn't very completely elliptical, but there was some roundness to it. But again, as they're describing him, they're describing it in a balanced way. So even when we say roundness, it wasn't a roundness that was uh, يعني, a roundness that people would not deem to be beautiful. <coughs> Here he's talking about his skin color. مشرب. So, abiyad means white. Mushrab means there's a kind of tinge to it. So, he wasn't a pale white, but he was a type of white, and usually the tinge they're talking about, and mushrab, or sharba, it would be red, or ahmar. So, it was a whiteness that was sort of because of the, uh, let's say, the, the health, the good health of the Prophet Sallallahu then underneath that skin there would be sort of a, a tinge of redness. So he was not completely dark, nor was he completely white or pale, but somewhere in between. Ad'aj al Ad'aj al describing his eyes. Well, Ad'aj is the one there's two particular interpretations for it, either the one whose uh, blackness or the iris of the eye, the, pu or the pupil of the eye is uh, very dark as compared to the whiteness that surrounds it for the color of the eye. Or it's very distinctive, being able to see the pupil from around the whiteness, or the, I guess it's called the, the iris of the eye. And the ashra, here describing the eyelashes. Right. So the eyelashes were long, right, or plentiful, but again, not in a way that would be effeminate or in a way that would be deemed not too masculine. Jalilun Mushash. Well, Ketat. Well, Mushash are the joints, especially here it's talking about uh, the shoulder joints where the arm meets the shoulder or the knees. 
where the thigh meets the lower leg. So Jalil means Azim, yeah, it's something that sort of big in terms of where those joints met. So he wasn't fine boned, but rather he was more thick boned. But again, not to an extent that would be considered uh, out of the ordinary or strange. Well catted. Well catted also is referring to to the joints. Uh, ajrat. Here ajrat, either referring to that, because the next section was talking about the hair that he had on his arms and on his chest. So ajrat meaning he had no hair except for that which is mentioned following. Or ajrat meaning when uh, when you can see his uh, you know the his arms or hands and there's cl clothing over them, you can see a sort of light uh, there that you see. And that will come later an explanation of this. Du masrabatin. Right? Well, masruba, they say is, you know, it's kind of interesting that the Arabs even have a word for this, because we don't even have a word in English, which is uh, a thin line of hair coming from right underneath the collar to the navel, to the belly button. So, the Sahaba did see the Prophet so I said him his chest on occasion. And so it was a thin line of hair coming from right here in the collar all the way down to, to the navel. And not hair on either of his breastplates or on his stomach, as described in the hadith. Shafnul Kafaini wal Qadami. Right, well, Shaf also is referring to either al ghalid al asabah min al kafain wal qadamin, a type of ghilda or thickness to the hands and to the feet. So, not having very fine, delicate fingers, but rather something that's closer to uh, a stronger type of hand. To you know, the joints in, in the fingers themselves would be something that closer to a bigger size than a smaller size. So there he stops and he's, he's, so far he's described physically what he looks like. And then he goes on to the next part of the hadith here and he's going to sort of describe how he walked and even how he interacted with people. So getting into something that's more of a, uh, a meaningful description of the character of the Prophet So Sayyidina Ali says, إِذَا مَشَى فَقَلَّعَ كَأَنَّمَا يَنْحَطُّ فِي صَدَبٍ إِذَا مَشَى well, qala, right? Same word as iqla when a plane takes off, or qala al asnan when you pull out a tooth. So it's saying that when he walked, that's as if he puts his foot down, and then it's like he ripped something of the ground out, literally as he's walking. So his walking was a deliberate walking, purposeful type of walking. Yani meshi du hadaf. Not just a stroll. He didn't stroll. Right? His, his, his walking was something that was purposeful and he was going somewhere. And wherever he went and walked was somewhere important. <laughs> this came in a hadith last week as if he was coming down a slope. Because there was a, a, a vigor to his walk. I'm not going to say speed per se. Right, he wasn't walking too fast that looked, it looked like it was funny, but a purposefulness and a vigor to his walk that was clearly unmistakable when one would, would look at him and see the way that he would walk. With a tafata and tafata ma, right? And when he turns to someone, specifically when he's turning around behind his back, he would turn completely. So he wouldn't, you know, move his neck all the way around to look like this behind him because that's deemed something. Well, they say mukhil bin muru'a, yani something that's not really becoming of someone of, of his dignity and of his respect. And also it shows respect when you're speaking to someone or you're turning towards someone that you give them your full attention, right? You turn to them all the way. And at the very least, if you had someone on his right on his left, he would at least turn and look at them and, you know, address them and they address him. But this is, I, I, I emphasize this a little bit because nowadays we have a sort of phenomenon where, where uh, people are like doing other things when you're trying to talk to them. They'll be playing with their phone or they'll be uh, doing something else and, like, and you're talking to them and they're not actually 
with you. And you, that person might be paying attention to what you're saying, but it leaves you with the feeling like, I guess whatever you're doing with your phone is more important than what you have, you have to hear me to say. And the Prophet right? he would always take someone's khatira. He would always look out. He was very people oriented in that sense. You know, in these, I took one of these management training things. They took about people oriented and task oriented and so forth. But he was someone who was very people oriented in the sense that he would look out for people's feelings. And he would do his utmost to ensure that no one's feelings were hurt. And to such an extent, to such a great deal, that every one of the Sahaba always thought he was the one most beloved by him. They all thought I was number one in his book. And we all know that, we may have said this last week, but the famous hadith of Amr ibn al-As, when he said, he said I, I felt like the Prophet I said, I was the best companion that he had. So he wanted to actually test the theory. And so he went and asked the Prophet I said, you know, who's better, me or uh, Uthman? He's like, uh, or me or Abu Bakr? First, he said, "No, Abu Bakr is better than you." It's like, okay, I'm number two. How about me or Omar? Mm, no, Omar is better than you too. Okay, number three, me or Uthman? No, actually. And then he kept saying names until he said, "I wish I never asked him." <laughs> right. So he had to be he had to be sincere. What the Prophet Sallallahu told him, but he always made people feel like they were, you know, the most important thing he was doing right then and right at that time. And we can take an example for that and how. We deal with other people, we deal with our children, we deal with uh, spouses and things like this. And I remind myself before anyone else, we live such a sort of fast pace and you got to be doing a million things at once so we feel it's quite normal to play with the phone or the computer while someone is talking. And, but, it, it, you know, the person walks away thinking that, you know, I don't think I'm that important or, you know, I kind of wasted their time or something like that. So, the the between his shoulders on the back, there was the khatum or the seal of prophethood. There's actually a separate chapter that comes after this one talking about khatum nubuwa, so I'm not going to go too much now. But it was a physical mark that was between uh, his shoulders that was something like, they say, the size of an egg, or something like that, or uh, a quail egg, uh, in between his two shoulders. And as we know from the seerah, this is one of the signs that people who knew of the coming of the Prophet said, like the Jews and others who had it in their books that he was coming, this is one of the things they looked for. They looked for Qatim and Nubuwa, because it was mentioned in their books, in the Injil or Torah, and they, they looked for it when they found the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Ajwad al-Nasi Sadra Right? Ajwad al-Nasi Sadra in another way, it says, Awsa al Nasi Sabra. So, Al Jud or Al Wusa here is talking about, uh, and Sabr is his chest. But here it's not referring to the chest per se, it's talking about his heart. In other words, his dealing with people, the best word you can think of is that he had a, a lot of tolerance and clemency. A lot of patience with people, no matter what their particular situation was, no matter how rude they became, no matter how uh, even unconscionable their behavior was, even to the Sahaba around him. And there are many instances <coughs> in the Sirah where we find people doing outlandish things, possibly. Sorry about that. So there are many instances in the Sirah where certain things would be done in the presence of the Prophet so I send them or to him and you would find the reaction of the companions much more than his own reaction. Like the Arabi who would walk into the mosque and not knowing he would urinate in a corner of the mosque and the Sahaba ready to get up and you know do something to him and he tells them stop. Don't do anything. And he goes and he actually cleans it up himself. So he had Yani Ajwad al Nasi Sadran Awsa al Nasi Sadran means he had so much tolerance for what people do and how they react and their level of understanding and so forth. Uh, and that's that's a rare attribute to find in people today. Most people when they become somewhat more in tune with their religion, become a little more religious, 
one of the early things that they go through or even that can afflict them later is that they have a sort of intolerance for people who are not as religious as they are. And we have to be very careful with that because we live in societies now that are, are very fragmented and categorized. So if you seem to be like a religious person, then people will look at you not just as your, as your individual self, but they'll look at you as a representative of the deen. That's where the danger comes in. Whether you like it or not, you, know, you may say to yourself, I don't want to be that. But nevertheless, people will look at you like that. If a woman wears hijab, if a man looks to be appears a religious, then they're going to say, Ah, fulan mutadayin, kada. So when they see that, and then if something were to come from you of a type of behavior that would only validate the suspicions they already have, right? I've, I've spoken to many people who, who uh, for one reason or another, don't practice Islam that much. And the, the recurring theme that I hear most often is that, well, this person prays, but look, they're terrible. They, they steal, they lie, they cheat, they do this. So they have a justification of their own behavior by people who seem to be religious, their bad behavior. And so when this happens, you become a fitna for people. You become a test and a trial, either knowingly or unknowingly, for other people. And to the extent that you could actually be pushing them away from, from something that they could, have, they could have entered into or they could have known more about, but because of the way you are, that pushes them away. And so it's a natural human inclination to want to see uh, uh, moral uprightness with ibadat, with outward Religious, religiosity. If they don't see that, and they see there's a, a conflict between the two, then oftentimes it's enough to push them away. Is it always my fault if I'm not that right person, doing everything in the right way? I mean, he's thinking, مثلا, or whatever, whoever, he's thinking that, that I'm a good person, I'm always doing the right thing. It's not his fault. Of course, no, we can't say that it's all our fault, but it's just something to keep in mind that uh, people are going to look at us like that especially in, in Egypt and Cairo and right now and the way things are because people are looking for a type of excuse to to uh, you know to uh, to criticize people of religion and especially the, the political system and, and the turmoil it's going through and so forth so people are waiting for that it's like they're waiting for you to make a mistake and that's it's a kind of charged uh, environment but nonetheless we have to be that much better I mean, we have, to, we have to surprise them, more or less. Because there are people there who are validating their suspicion. There's too many people who, who talk the talk and, you know, have the big beard and ha seem to have all that. But, you know, they do, uh, you know, unspeakable things. You know, these so-called uh, mashayikh, I don't really like to use that word, that we see on TV and accuse people of zina and adultery and all sorts of things. Sharan هذا لا يجوز بالمرة أبدا. And in fact, someone who accuses someone else of that type of act, of zina or fornication, adultery, without any witnesses, هذا is قذف, قذف المحصنات. And if you do that, then you're the one who's punished. If you have two other witnesses by your, by, besides yourself, and you don't have a fourth, you would still be considered to be applicable to punishment to you for false, falsely accusing someone of, of that type of act. <coughs> but this so-called shaykh or shiukh, they're juhada, they don't know anything. They don't even know the simplest uh, ahkam, the simplest legal rulings in the deen. But yet, what happens as a result is tenfir. People, you know, say, if that's a religion, I don't want that. And honestly, I can't blame them. If that was what I know of Islam and those people and the way they look and the way they act and talk and their accusations, I wouldn't want to be that either. So the way to, to counter that is to show people that that's not what it really is. That's not a, uh, the legacy of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa that person is not Muhammadan in character. He doesn't act like him. He doesn't look like him. He doesn't talk like him. He doesn't show any of the, the true essence of what the Prophet ﷺ came with. Right? He wouldn't curse people. He wouldn't yell in the, in the, in the marketplace. He wouldn't disparage people. He wouldn't do any of those things. I know this guy is a very nice guy and he's a good guy. 
See, why is his fault? No, no, it's not his fault. But we we can't change other people's perception. We can only change what we can do. So it's fine. But that's you, know, you have to keep in mind that people who um, you have to understand the psychology of the person who knows feels a little bit guilty that they're not doing things right. But when they see someone so-called today and someone so-called religious making a mistake, they feel so great about that. Why? Because it validates, it gives them a justification for the way that they are. They said, oh, well, Fulan, he's a sheikh, look what he's doing, that. I'm not so bad. It means they have a little bit of guilt. And that person who said, haram ala da'nak, he has deen, right? Because if he didn't have deen, he wouldn't even say that much. There's some deen in him, there's some good in him, because he sees that part and he wants, he feels guilty, so he feels the need to go and say something like that. So someone like that, there's good in them. And I, I remind myself, for everyone else, we have to look for the good in the people before we see the bad. You'll see a lot of bad, you'll see a lot of things you don't like. The more that you read, the more that you read about the Prophet and the companions and how they were, you'll say to yourself, nothing is like what we're reading about. Everything outside is different. Right? But if you think about what he had to deal with, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? 360 idols in the Kaaba, people sometimes going around making tawaf naked, uh, lying, cheating, stealing, <coughs> violence being done. You cannot say with any sort of conscience that what they had was much better than what we're dealing with now. What we're dealing with now is nothing compared to, to what our prede predecessors had to deal with. Um, and even after the time of the Sahaba, even throughout our history, there have been many, many difficult situations. Uh, the fall of Baghdad, the fall of the Abbasid Empire in 658 was a catastrophe for the Ummah, a complete catastrophe. But there were great ulama who came around that time, like Imam al uh Imam al-Ghazali sometime before that. Uh, and then after them, Ibn al al Imam Ibn al-Hajib, and many of the great ulama who came later on. So uh, it's, not, it's not a good measure to say that, well, it's so difficult now and it's impossible and they didn't have it like we had it. The difference between us and them is that maybe we have fewer people percentage-wise, those who can admonish us, those who can advise us, those who can remind us. And that's why we're trying to come together and do this, because we need more people like that. We need to have more people in the society to, to be able to, to fix things. Society is not going to be fixed from the top. It's going to be fixed by individuals and then by families and then by communities and then by the greater society around them. Allah it's a long topic, it's something we could spend much time on, but yeah, we'll, we'll touch on it here and there, inshaAllah. فَأَجْوَدُ النَّاسِ صَدْرًا Right, أَجْوَدُ النَّاسِ صَدْرًا He was someone who had a lot of compassion, a lot of tolerance, and a lot of understanding for the human condition. He knew where people were coming from. Right, when the A'rabi would come and speak in his particular accent that none of the other Sahaba would know, he would reply to them in their same accent, their same lahja. When they would come, he would also ask them about who are your poets? Who is, don't you know Fulan and Fulan? You know, one time he said to one of them, Don't you know Umay ibn Abi Salt, who was one of the poets from a tribe in the middle of the Arabian Peninsula? And no one else knew from the locals in Medina what the Prophet was talking about. But that is, in fact, from amongst his mu'ajizat, from amongst his miracles, that he had knowledge of the language. Right? Imam al Shafi said, La yuhitu bilugha illa nabi. No one can know the language really except the Prophet. That's like a mu'ajizah. That he was able to speak to them and reply to them in the same distinctive dialect that they came with. Uh, and he was able to win hearts in this way. He wasn't there to, to, uh, to smite the heads off. He was there to win hearts, to bring hearts to the deen. وَأَصْدَقُ النَّاسِ لَهْجَةً Right here, lahja originally means tongue or language, but in this context, it's talking about his speech. Asdaq, yani the most truthful of people in what they spoke, right? Even his most, uh, his worst enemies were asked, Hal Did you ever find him to be a liar? We never found him to lie. He was known as Al-Ameen, Al-Ameen. The person that they would leave their wada'a, would leave their valuables with, even when they were fighting him, even when they were boycotting him, even when they were sending armies to him in Medina. He would be the one they left their valuables with. 
Ali stayed back after the Hijrah radiallahu anhu just to return many of these wada'a, many of these valuables that people had left with him uh, as he was making the migration of the Hijrah to al Medina. So no one can ever claim that he lied about anything, period. And even our worst enemies, the people who disparage Islam much, they can't find any point where he lied about anything. أَصْلَقُ النَّاسِ لَهَجَةً وَأَلْيَنَهُمْ عَرِيكَةً وَالْعَرِيكَةً الطَّبِيعَةً or a personality or you know like a trait personal trait or personal characteristic alienahum right alien and it's interesting the word alien here was used instead of many other attributes and when you're dealing with arika uh, or tabi'a it's talking about how one deals with other people right falin wa rifq so gentleness and ease right is how he was described in this particular hadith and this word lean, you find it in, in other places, like in the Quran, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructed Musa and Harun and Moses and Aaron to go to Pharaoh, Fir'aun, فَقُولَ لَهُ قَوْلًا لَيِّنَا Right? لَيِّنَا And who is Fir'aun? Right? He is Malik al-Jababara. He is the worst tyrant who ever lived. There's no one enemy mentioned more in the Quran than Fir'aun. لَعَلَّهُ even more than, than the Satan himself. He's mentioned in the Quran, Fir'aun. But nevertheless, قُولَا لَهُ قَوْلًا لَيِّنًا لَعَلَّهُ يَتَذَكَّرُ أَوْ يَخْشَى But he wasn't. There wasn't any tadakkur wala khashya. It wasn't going to happen. Allah SWT knew it wasn't going to happen. But nevertheless, that's not the point. The point is, he's teaching, right? The, sah the prophets themselves are teaching those that come after, even with a tyrant. Even with the worst of tyrants, قُولَا لَهُ قَوْلًا لَيِّنًا when you're bringing the, uh, the message to them for the first time in a way that's palpable that they can understand. So he was alien in nas, alienahum arikatan. He was the most soft, the most gentle in his manner with people, Muslim and non-Muslim. Right? We have this uh, picture in our head that aizzatan uh, al uh, Right? The ayah before that? Muhammad al Rajim al Awam. La la ta shudda al kufar rahma u baynahum. Oh, hatta that ayah. A shudda al kufar rahma u baynahum. Describing Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his companions. A shudda al kufar rahma u baynahum. People read that verse and they, or the other verse, Aizatan al kafirin, Adilatan al mu'min, Aizatan al kafirin. Right? Another verse. That so we are merciful amongst fellow Muslims but we are stern and tough with people who are not Muslim or I should say kuffar as the Quran says or the other, ver the other verse adillatan al mu'min a'izzatan al kafirin la yakhafuna fi allahi law matala'in here al-izz right or stern or dignified with the kuffar Adilla and humbled with the other believers. Some people interpret that erroneously that that means we have to be very stern, we don't give them salam, we don't look at them, we don't deal with them, kada, we're not allowed to interact with them. That's not what the verse is talking about. Because one, here, the verse didn't say in Mushrikeen, it said al kuffar. And kufr is a state of the heart. Just like iman is a state of the heart. Just like nifaq. Hypocrisy is a state of the heart. So if that's the case, you don't really know who the kuffar are. So how can you be shidda al kuffar ruhama How can where is the shidda al kuffar? What it's talking about is shidda ala tariqat al kuffar. Right? It's dealing with the ways of kuffar, not with the kuffar per se. So those things that are of kufr, those things that are obviously are not coming from or are in not in, in tune with an Islamic ethos and understanding are rejected. Absolutely. Right? Things that are not in line with what we believe and what, how we practice our deen. Cheating, lying, stealing. That's all acts of people who are not believers. Even though believers may do them, non-believers may do them. So it's talking about dealing with the forces of kufar that which emanates from them more than the individuals themselves. And this is the danger of reading particular ayahs out of context and not understanding the whole 
meaning or the holistic meaning of, of the Qur'an or the holistic meaning of the hadith. Because anyone can use a text, yani nas, min al-Qur'an or min al-hadith, and make it seem like or support anything that he wants it to support. <coughs> you take it out of context, you take a few words, you chop off here and there, and you can make it seem like it's supporting your argument. But that's not how you interpret the Qur'an or the Sunnah. You interpret the Qur'an or the Sunnah by understanding its maqasid, understanding its main objectives, understanding it in its uh, themes and its entirety. Not taking little things here and there and then making those general rulings. This is a danger that many people are falling into. And especially non-specialists. People who claim to be shi'it, right? It's not an honorific title. It's something that has to be earned. It's something that has to be validated by one's peers and one's teachers. If you don't have that, just putting shaykh in the front of your name doesn't make you shaykh or teacher or ustaz or alim or kada. Um, and so one of the signs you can discern for people who are making claims and are not really representing what they're claiming is that they'll take things out of context and very often they'll mention individuals by name or groups by name and vilify them. That's not a prophetic trait. That's not how the Prophet would add, uh, show admonition or to... Uh, even condemn a particular act, he wouldn't mention people by name. He would say, what do you think? What about a people who do such and such? Home. Very generic, very uh, non-specific, not taking someone specifically. But when you find people getting specifics and mention Fulan by name, oh, Fulan That's not the way of the Prophet Right? So... <coughs> also is a type of mu'amala. Arika you can think more as like people dealing people the first time or people who are not that close. Amal ishra only happens after a longer period of experience with them. So here we enter into al karam. Akramahum ishratan, the most generous not just in wealth, not in, in giving f in monetarily, but in giving of themselves. Akramahum ishratan. So he gave himself freely when he dealt with people. Right? He didn't sort of um, hold back on his generosity based upon the person in front of them. If he can give, he gave. Man ra'ahu badihatan haba. Wa man khalatahu ma'rifatan ahabba. This is one of the very famous lines from the Shama'il, you find it often repeated in some of the Luhat, especially the Hilya, which is a description of uh, the Prophet Sallallahu And it's, it's a beautiful line, these two here, right? Because it, it gives you two words that seem sort of in contradiction to each other, but not really. Al-Mahaba wal-Mahabba. So here, man ra'ahu badihatan, yani you see him for the first time, will be in awe. You see him for the first time, you'll be in awe. He'll just awe you. The Sahaba couldn't even look to the Prophet and look up at his face, most of them, because they were in complete awe. They couldn't. It was just too much. One of them who came to him was, was shivering, yartash, and couldn't stop. And the Prophet said, Hawn and Ali. But from Adamat al Mawqif, you know, being in the presence of the Prophet, can you imagine? He's sitting right here in front of us, and we're sitting with him. And he's able to speak to us. And it's, it's, it's not imaginable. You can't imagine how it would be. But those who got to know him, right, really know him, loved him. All of the things that we're hearing now, these cartoons and the, the YouTube video, film, I don't know if it's a film, it's a video. And all these things directed towards criticizing the Prophet Sallallahu They're not criticizing the Prophet Sallallahu right? Even the Prophet Sallallahu in his time, when uh, the wife of Abu Lahab would criticize him and she would make this sort of mockery, his name is Muhammad. Muhammad means most praised, min al-hamd. And this is a, what we call a mubalagh form. So kathir al-tahmid, yani people praise him often, the most oft praised. That's his name, right? And, and how, how true is the ism al musamma right? The name for that attribute which he has. There is no person more praised than the Prophet Sallallahu These little things that some person in Los Angeles got together and filmed a YouTube or 
cartoons and it's nothing compared to how oft praised that he is day and night and year after year and decade after decade and century after centuries if you out of all the people who are praising there isn't a second of the day that someone is not praising the Prophet Muhammad not a second of the day that's not saying la ilaha illa Muhammad Rasulullah with the adhan, with dhikr, with salat on Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so what is this little droplet next to an ocean of praise for him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam but uh, so the wife of Abu Lahab, she wouldn't say Muhammad, she would say Mudhammam which is the opposite and a them, which is to censure, to criticize someone. So he would tell, don't worry, they're, they're criticizing Mudhammam, not Muhammad, it's not me. Fa'alan, it's not him. They don't know him. What do they know about him? What does that cartoonist in Denmark know about the Prophet Sallallahu Do you think he ever opened up the Shema'il and read about him? Or his Sirah Nabawiya? Or any of the translations? Or do you think he actually ever met a Muslim who was a true representative of the Prophet in his essence or her essence and in their character? Do you think that ever happened to him? I can almost say with, with complete certainty that he didn't. So who is he talking about? Who is he, who is he writing? Who is he criticizing? He's criticizing Mudhammam. That's not our Prophet that's someone else. But his picture of Mudhammam came from where? Came from us, collectively. right? That's what they think Islam is. They think Islam is what they see in the news, which for whatever reason it could be exaggerated, is incorrect, but there is some validity to it in that many of the acts that we do, that we purport to do, that we claim that we reflect on the deen, reflect very, very badly on the deen. Right? When you get people on TV, and even in the way that they criticize those who criticize the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? running to the American embassy here and getting to the top and ripping the American flag and throwing bottles and trying to hurt the police? Are you telling me that's in indicative of the, the way of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Does that represent him? Or to go into the Libyan consulate and kill the ambassador? Is that representative? Would, that, would he have done such a thing? Or after the Denmark controversy, the burning of the Danish embassy in Damascus, was that representative? What did they have to do with the whole thing? So, yeah, and we have to inculcate the real, real character of the Prophet ﷺ, which means the sabr al adha We have to be patient with people's intolerance and their own hatred towards us. Because if we meet a wrong with a wrong, it's going to go nowhere. But if we meet a wrong with our own true essence, who we're supposed to be, then things can change. مَنْ رَأَوْ بَدِيَةً هَابَ وَمَنْ خَالَتْهُ مَعْرِفَةً أَحَبَّهُ يقول ناعته يعني وبه describes him will say this لم أرى قبله ولا بعده مثله صلى الله عليه وسلم right and he ends with this because there's so much more that could be said about him but you, it's too much you can't describe it so to sort of summarize everything you say I haven't seen anyone before him nor have I seen anyone after him like him صلى الله عليه وسلم right and that's sort of almost the epitome of praise when you say, I haven't seen anyone like him either before or no one ever who came after him was like him either. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's sort of uh, admitting your, your incapacity to properly praise him, to praise him in the right way, in the way that he should be praised. And don't believe those people who say, you know, be careful of these people because they, they love the Prophet too much or they praise him too much. Praise him too much? Kif, how do we praise him too much? Ismu Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. How can we praise him too much? Or the ghulu fi Muhammad al Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Kif anakun yani mutagadin fi hub al Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. How can we be too much? We didn't make him a god, but we made him the prophet of God. And that's his makana, that's his place. And if it were not for him, we wouldn't know Allah, we wouldn't know the deen, we wouldn't know the Quran, we wouldn't know who we are. The Sahaba didn't know who they were before him. And they didn't know who they were. After him, Anas ibn Malik, he said, "Ma nafadna aidiyana min dafni Nabi صلى الله عليه وسلم حتى أنكرنا قلوبنا أو أنكرنا نفوسنا." He said, "We didn't finish burying the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم and dusting our hands from burying him until we didn't even know who we were anymore. We didn't know who we were. We didn't know our hearts. That was the biggest disaster. Actually, the biggest disaster ever to afflict this ummah was the death of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. All that came after is hayyin, but that was the biggest." There was never a fitna like his death.
But he said about himself, إِنَّ حَيَاتِ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ وَإِنَّ مَمَاتِ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ My life is better for you and also my death is also better for you. So the next part actually, um, he's just, the, the alfaz, he was just describing them, you could read that and we talked about it more or less. So I think we'll just read, this is a long hadith too, we'll just read the 8th hadith and see how much we can get through, inshallah, if I'm so careful about it. حدثنا سفيان بن وكيع قال حدثنا جمير بن عمير بن عبد الرحمن الأجلي إملاء علينا من كتابه قال أخبرني رجل من بني تميم من ولد أبي هالة زوج خديجة يكنى أبا عبد الله عن ابن لأبي هالة عن الحسن بن علي رضي الله عنه قال سألت خالي عند ابن أبي هالة وكان وصافا عن حلية رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وأنا أشتهي أن يصف لي منها شيئا أتعلق به فقال كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم فخما مفخما يتلألأ وجهه تلألأ القمر ليلة البدر أطول من المربوع وأقصر من المشذب عظيم الهامة رجل الشعر إذا فرقت عقيقته فرقها وإلا فلا يجاوز شعره شحمة أذني إذا هو وفر أزهر اللون واسع الجبين أزج الحواجب سوابغ في غير قرن بينهما عرق يضره الغضب أقنى العرنين له نور يعلو يحسبه من لم يتأمله أشم كف اللحية سهل الخدين ضريع الفم مفلج الأسنان دقيق المأسربة كأن عنقه جيد دمية في صفاء الفضة معتدل الخلق باد متماسك سواء البطن والضر والصبر عريض الصبر بعيد أو بعيد ما بين المنكبين دخم الكراديس أنور المتجرد موصول ما بين اللبة والسرة بشعر يجري كالخط عاري الثديين والبطن مما سوى ذلك أشعر الذراعين والمنكبين وأعالي الصبر طويل الزندين رحب الراحة شثم الكفين والقدمين سائل الأطراف أو قال شائل الأطراف قمصان الأخمصين مسيح القدمين ينبو عنهما الماء إذا زال زال قلعا يخذ تكفئا ويمشي هونا ذريع المشية إذا مشى كأنما ينحط من صبب وإذا التفت التفت جميعا خافض الطرف نظره إلى الأرض أطول من نظره إلى السماء جل نظره الملاحظة يسوق أصحابه ويبدر من لقي السلام This is probably the most famous hadith dealing with the description, the physical description of the Prophet of uh, of Hind Abu, Abu Hala Ibn Abi Hala and he was related to Khadija so he was a nephew of Khadija and he had lived uh, uh, with the Prophet in the same household so he knew him quite well or he was actually the stepson of the Prophet from uh, Khadija from a previous marriage Khadija was married twice before she married the Prophet and she was widowed twice and she had some children and one of them was uh, Hind Ibn Abi Hala. And Abu Hala was a previous uh, husband for Sayyidah Khadija. So he, dis- he was close to him and he described him. And it's described in his head, وَكَانَ وَصَّافًا عَنْ حِلِيَةُ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ So in other words, he was well known for him, his ability to describe in detail the Prophet Sallallahu at least even his physical description. كَانَ وَصَّافًا لِحِلِيَةِ النَّبِي صلى الله عليه وسلم. So first he says the Messenger of Allah وسلم, was Fakhman Mufakhama. So Al Fakhama uh, is a greatness or Adama or type of awe that you see when you look at someone. Fakhman, in other words, he was great in, in his own person. Mufakhama, others saw him as great as well. So the two words are different. Fakhman Mufakhama. Mufakham, yani Mufakham in Ghairihi. والفخ يعني فخ من في نفسه so he was both 
So he wasn't just someone people thought to be great. He was great, as in the description of Hind. يَتَلَأْلَأُ وَجْهُهُ تَلَأْلُؤُ الْقَمَرِ لَيْلَةَ الْبَدْرِ Here, يَتَلَأْلَأُ مِنَ اللُؤْلُؤُ Right, and لُؤْلُؤُ is pearls. So, his face radiated like the radiance of pearls in the same manner the تَلَأْلُؤُ of the Qamar, the radiance of the moon on a full night, a full moon night. So like a 13th, 14th, and 15th of, of the month. This is a type of metaphor, a type of simile or tashbih. In other words, the Prophet is being compared to the moon in a particular sense, in terms of its talatlu, or its nur, its radiance. Usually in the language, when you compare, you have, uh, you have in mushabbah, when mushabbah is being, or wajud tashbih. Right? And mushabbah uh, is that which you are you're comparing something. When mushabbah be, what you're comparing it to. Wajud tashbih, what's being compared? What particular attribute is compared from those? So if I say, uh, <coughs> uh, <coughs> Abdullah, my son, he's, uh, he is as strong as his brother Abdurrahman. Masalan. That means, if I'm comparing Abdullah to Abdurrahman, means that the attribute of strength is more in Abdul Rahman than it is in Abdullah, even though I said he is as as strong. Because what's being compared to has to have more of the attribute than that which is being compared from. Except when we talk about the Prophet. So when we say we're comparing him to the moon and its radiance, it's not a valid comparison. Actually, what we should be doing is comparing the moon to him. Right? Because the moon is nothing compared to his radiance. And some of the Sahaba, and, and it's mentioned, Dila, and I think al Bayhaqi says this, that uh, <coughs> when the moon would be out and they saw the Prophet ﷺ, it's like they didn't see the moon. They didn't see the moon, they saw him. Because he was more radiant in that sense. In a physical sense, more radiant even than, than the moon. But in order to, to draw a comparison, to give people some idea, they had to compare him to something else. And another hadith, they will find him compared to the sun. Right, the radiance of the sun, of shams. Again, to give a type of uh, description of understanding, just some idea. So, But he was even more than that. This we can, did before, in terms of his height. Long, you know, taller than the average medium build, but not too short. Azim uh, al-Hama. And Hama here is the head. So we had uh, a physically large head in comparison, relatively speaking, and this was something that was mabdu'ah and al Arab. It was something that was uh, desirable for, for the Arabs of his time. Rajal uh, al-Sha'ri, his hair was not too uh, curly, but it was uh, slightly wavy. Idan faraqat aqiqatuhu wal aqiqa is the, the bangs on the, f on the front or the forehead. So if it was, if when he parts it, it was able to be parted easily, he would part it, otherwise he would let it fall. And then usually his hair would not go beyond, Shahmat al-Udun is like the earlobe right here. And it said that the longest his hair would ever be <coughs> would be right before the shoulders. So even a little bit longer than that, sometimes over here, but you know, varying in length from, from the earlobe to to uh, right before the shoulders. Azhar al again describing his skin color, a type of whiteness with some redness in it. Wasa al jabin his forehead would be wide, again going with a larger head, which was also a desirable trait with uh, the Arabs. Azaj al hawajib, sawabida fi ghayri qaranin. Here are the eyebrows. Azaj means mithl qos or like rounded, uh, like a bow, right? Sawabil, um, full, right? Same word that you will use, asbagh al wudu, someone completes the wudu in the best way or in the most perfect way. So, sawabil, so the eyebrows were in the most perfect way. Fi um, ghayri qaranin, but they were not joined, so it wasn't a unibrow. So, we had two distinct. Uh, eyebrows. 
بينهما عرق يضره الغضب in between them here there was a vein that when he became angry it was discernible and that's that's actually significant because it kind of implies that we couldn't tell if he was angry unless we saw this become uh, the vein here we can see it and the Prophet ﷺ did become angry in the sense that there were things that would make him angry but his behavior would not reflect the behavior of an angry person or a violent person right his anger only and he would only become angry for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he never became angry on account of his own person he would be praying in the Kaaba and they would come and bring the camel entrails and throw it on his back and so forth it didn't make him angry what made him angry is al ghadab lillah and when we talk about ghadab lillah a lot of people like to claim that it's kind of everybody's excuse their justification for for doing bad things doing really pretty awful things to other people so you know why did you yell at that person why did you slap them around why did you treat them this way why are you violent to this particular person Right? I'm angry for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They were doing something Allah doesn't like, so that made me angry. Really? Did it really make something for Allah or did it make you angry personally? Right? And oftentimes, going on the theme we mentioned before, we take things that make us affect us personally and then we try to frame it in the framework of the deen. And this is where the real danger is, because other people can pick up on that. And so they start thinking that, well, if that's the deen, I don't, I don't want that. But it's all about your own personal shortcomings, your own personal anger. It's not about being angry for the deen, it's about your own personal anger. Mem al-Ghazali, sahib al-Ihya, he talks about some of the ways about how people can discern whether you're actually angry for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or you're actually only angry on, on your own account. And I can, don't really have time to go into them here, but the, the thing that he was stressing is that uh, don't fool yourself right there's a type of way of fooling yourself where you know what's what's real and what's not but you so sort of, if you keep lying to yourself then eventually you start to believe it so don't fool yourself and think you're actually becoming angry on account of the deen or this is what's doing it for you but look to your to your own soul so I believe I need complete عندك في الحاشي number six a كوامل يعني perfect complete كذا بينهما عرق يضره الغضب so this small vein in between they can tell when he became angry أقنى العرنين here describing uh, his nose and it was a, a prominent nose as most Arabs had in other words, that this lot, this part here, was something that was a little bit raised. This is the adnin, they say, the, the the hard part, the bony part, not the cartilage part, but the hard part over here, is an adnin. So aqna yani murtafa shay'an ma. Again, that was a, a desirable attribute for the Arab. Lahu nurun yaaluhu, yahsabuhu man lam yata'amalhu asham. So here, there was a type of light that would uh, be around him, surround him, his aura, and someone who didn't really someone didn't really look to that would think that there was like no space between him and the sky. Yani the it would be sort of an aura around him of light, and he wouldn't really see. Where he ended, the Prophet says, "Man lam yata'amalhu." The mutaamil is someone who looks imaan another, someone who really looks and, dis and discerns. But at first sight, you would just see light; you wouldn't see anything besides that. So you wouldn't know where he ends and where the sky begins and all of that type of thing. Kath al lahya, or al lahya. So he had a, a prominent beard. 
I didn't say طول اللحية, it said كف. كف means uh, thick. And there's some يعني, uh, difference of opinion of how big it actually was. Uh, some of the other rayats say that it went down beyond his neck, even to almost the chest level. Uh, some say it wasn't out bushy like that, but it was something that was more muhazdab, uh, something that was more um, uh, not as ish uh, muhazdab, not trim, but uh, more becoming. And there's other hadith that point the Prophet said once time saw a man who looked ashaf, who looked yani, very unkempt. Yani, he was kempt. So he saw, he saw someone who was unkempt and he said, you know, clean yourself up and because his beard was going all over the place and things like that. And so the, the appearance of the Muslim also should be something uh, that should look, uh, you know, uh, not, not attractive per se for a man or even for a woman. But something that's dignified, something that doesn't look like someone's not taking care of themselves. And, you know, some of these guys out there have these beards going all over the place. And uh, I don't think that's, that's reflecting the sunnah of, of the Prophet Because right? he told us to, you know, there are certain acts of fitrah, like cutting the nails and uh, other things and, and keeping oneself in a particular way. And he said, Huf al wa And even when he said, you know, uh, trim the mustache and let the beard grow obviously it didn't mean let it go without ever cutting it because if you take that literally the hadith literally right would mean that if I never cut it it would come down to my knees right if I were never to cut anything from it so there had to be some sort of tahdeed some sort of trimming and so forth. The ulama differ about the varying levels. Some of the madahib, like Imam Abu Hanifa, he says, al which means that you grab from here, and then whichever is coming from here, you cut. That's Imam Abu Hanifa and Imam Al-Adham, anhu. The other madahib didn't say a particular, um, they didn't say a particular limit, a qadda or a handful. They just said it should be kept in, in a manner that is, is uh, dignified. And some of them said, like Imam al-Shafi'i, that even the, the lahya and some of the interpretations is actually the, this part only. And that the, the cheeks are not really considered lughatan part in terms of the language as lahya. That's something else. So you find some of the ulama, for example, from Yemen and other places and uh, Indonesia, that they, they shave this part. And that's based upon a valid interpretation they have of, of what the lahya means. Uh, so when it says let the lahya grow, they meant it to mean like the chin hair is here only, right? And they say this part majmal lahyain where where this meets down here, this is the actual lahya. And ma this is not lughatan the same as this. So they let this part grow and then this is kept trim. Uh, again, that's a linguistic thing, but that's based upon ulama on scholars who have researched this and have found this and this a particular practice. And then people take that out of context and think, you know, they can have like this beard that's like this all over the place. Uh, I think it, it goes against the spirit of, of the sunnah itself. And that it pushes people away. It gives people a wrong impression of what the deed is. Allah Alam. Like I said, uh, the only madhab that stated a particular length was the Hanafi madhab. The other three, to my knowledge, didn't say a particular length. They just said, Yasun hatta. And even Imam al-Shafi said, Yukrah halqul lahya. In one of his duayas, that it's only uh, disliked to shave it. The other ones are a little more strict. They say it's haram. But Imam al-Shafi, from my understanding, says it's only makruh to shave it. Which means that if there's an opinion that allows it to be shaved without hurma, no one can condemn a person who does that. You may disagree with it, but you can't condemn them. If there's a valid opinion within the four schools of law, uh, that allows something to be done, and it's a valid opinion within that school, 
you have no right to condemn anyone who takes that opinion. You cannot. Al-amr bin ma'roof wa nahi anil munkar lahu shurut. There are conditions for that. One, it has to be amr mujma alayhi. Has to be something that everyone is in agreement with. You can't just pick something that is um, a minority opinion somewhere and then try to enforce that on everybody. Imam Malik rejected that. The Khalifa, the Abbas al Khalifa came to him, Haran al Rashid, and he said, Let's make Al Muwatta the book of the Muslims everywhere. Imam Malik had in his power, right then at that particular point in history, to make everybody Maliki. He could have done it if he just said yes. He didn't say yes. Even though he, he thought his particular methodology in his school was the most correct, because that's the one he was following, he refused to enforce it upon everybody. He said after the Prophet ﷺ died, the Sahaba spread out, and because the Madahab are based upon the Sahaba who, who <coughs> went to those particular lands, right, you'll find that the, the Madhab of Iraq, which is mostly Abu Hanifa, is based upon the Fiqh of Ibn Mas'ud, because he went to Iraq and so forth, and you find Malik is more like based on Ibn Umar because he stayed in Medina, uh, Shafi Ibn Abbas, Kada. So there were different schools based upon the, the companions leaving and Medina and living in other places. And naturally, they would have a different fit because the, the science, the discipline of fit or jurisprudence uh, can't be done in a vacuum, in the, in the meaning, meaning that I can't just say a universal fit sort of for everyone from every time and every place. Because one of the awam and one of the agents that inf informs and influences what a particular legal, legal ruling is, is time and place. So what may be valid for a particular time, particular place, may not be valid for another time and another place. So that being the case, Imam Malik knew that. So he said, I cannot allow you to take the muwatta and make it the book, the fit for everybody. That's not correct. That's not, that would be too much. So he refused that, even though it was his own, his own school. So... Uh, you know that that's important that we have a plurality. right? Fil fiqh al islami is something that is, yani, completely acceptable. Anyone who tells you that you have to follow this particular way, you have to do it in this way only, and all the other ways are wrong or incorrect, you're not allowed to do it that way. They have no idea what they're talking about. That is like a, a very narrow-minded uh, reductionist view of Islam that makes everything else seem superfluous compared to the way they have to do it. And it's not the way they have to do it. We accept different opinions because the nature of the Quran and the Sunnah is that it's subject to different interpretations. You can read the same verse, different scholars, and they can get different things out of it, or the same hadith, or the same group of hadith, depending upon their methodology. And you can't say one is more correct than the other because it's not, an, it's not a concept where you can reach what's called unequivocal uh, certainty in it or qata right al qati'a wal maqtu'a biha means those things that it's unequivocally certain there's no other way there are certain things in the deen that are like that but most of of the fiqh or the jurisprudence especially outside of ibadat when we're talking about mu'amalat and ahwal shakhsiya and ahkam al-zawaj and talaq divorce and marriage and these things there are variant opinions there, then you can't enforce one particular opinion because you can't say one particular opinion is the only correct one. None of the ulama did that. They would support evidence for their opinion, but at the end of the day, if they were asked, is there a possibility that you're wrong and Fulan is right? They said, of course. Of course there's a possibility. They accept that. But this is what their ishtihad has led them to. But now we're living in a time where people are starting to claim that, no, this is the only way and there can be no other right answer. So they're bringing something unprecedented that none of our ulama for the past 400 to 100 years have ever stated. That's the bid'ah. Hayri bid'ah. Ayn bid'ah. Allah a'ala. Ibn Ahdi Nufus. So, uh, where were we? Sahl al Khadjaini. Bodi al Fam. So also describing his cheeks and his uh, mouth Sahl al-Khaddaini yani they were of uh, not coarse, not wrinkled and in fact um, Imam al-Ghazali he mentions I believe somewhere in the Hayat that the Prophet said in terms of his outer appearance from the time he was a young man 
until the time he was an old man, it didn't really change much. You couldn't really tell that he had aged that much. They mentioned when they talk about his the, the white hairs that he had, some of them counted the number. Some of them said he had no more than 14, or no more than 8, or no more than 20. So even the white hairs that he had were, were very few. So uh, he was someone who, who appeared not to have aged that much to begin with. So Zili uh, al which means Wes al also a more prominent lips and mouth, was also a desirable trait for the Arab. Mufallaj al Asnan. Uh, also the Arabs in their culture to have some space between the incisor teeth and the teeth uh, in front of it or behind it was a desirable trait. Not to have spaces all throughout but in between what's called the thanaya which are the incisor teeth to have some of that space was a, was a desirable thing and that the Prophet Sallallahu had that attribute. The al Masruba, we talked about already, which is the thin line of hair running from the top of the chest all the way down to the navel. Here, another beautiful description, physical description. His neck, which is ivory. So it's as if his neck was, in terms of beauty and purity, like ivory. But in the purity of silver. So it's not really talking about color anymore because the difference in color between <coughs> ivory, which is pure white, and silver, which is silver, is, is significant. So it's not saying that there was a color that was like white or silver. Obviously, that's impossible. But it's talking about in terms of radiance and beauty, his neck is, is his himself, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, was of that, of that nature. So here is describing his upper body. He was of a, a, a balanced body build. Then he describes how so. Al-Badin is someone who is closer to uh, not too skinny, but not too uh, media but somewhere in between but more on the media side and but then he he shows how when he says mutamasik yani mutamasik uh, yani not mukhalkhal not loose with fat but more muscular in, in build so where ul batni was sub here they said that uh, the sameness in the chest and the stomach is referring to that the chest <laughs> was neither protruding out too much nor was the belly itself. So so what? So if you looked at him when straight on, you would see that it would kind of be like straight from the chest to to the stomach. So in other words, in in the in the physical shape that was that was desired. <laughs> but at the same time, he was broad chested in terms of this way, in terms of the width. Wide ma bin al mankabin aw wide riwayatan. Wide is tasgir, which means same meaning that he was broad between the shoulders, or the distance between the shoulders was significant. So he was broad chested and broad shouldered. Dakhmul Karadis. Here, Karadis is the joints, joints of the wrist and the hand and the ankles. Dakh, which means they were significant. Again, a desirable trait. Not fine bone, but more thick bone. Anwar al Mutajarrad. Here are the mutajarrad, either the places where he doesn't have hair or the places where he doesn't have clothing on top. So you can see a sort of light, a nur emanating from his skin, if you were to look at it. And this is the masruba, the line that we're talking about, from the chest to, to the navel. Ari thadiyaini wal batni mimma siwa dhalik. Ari means no hair on either side of the chest. والبط, as well as the stomach. But he did have hair on the arms and some of the upper chest here. This area. Except for obviously the line. Which 
which I think are the forearms. So they said, uh, حِسًّا وَمَعْنًا Physically and liter uh, literally and figuratively. So الرحب, الرحب, so rahab means واسع, يعني like a, a fleshy type of palm. But also rahab comes from something that's inviting. So his hand, his palm of his hand was also like that. Both physically and figuratively. And you'll find in other hadith we're going to read later on that they'll say they've never touched uh, a, a velvety silk as fine as the hand of the Prophet ﷺ when they touched his hands. So it was an, an inviting hand, it was a fleshier part of, of the body, but at the same time it was something that was inviting to people when he outstretched his hand. Shafr al kaffaini wal qadamain, again a thicker, uh, talking again about the hands and the feet. Sa'il al atraf. In other words, the, the extremities, like the fingers, were a little bit long, again in a way that was desirable for the Arabs. Awqal, Sha'ul al Atraf, a similar meaning. Humsanu al Akhmasaini. Well, Akhmas is the sole of the foot. Like if the, fo the foot has an arch, so the sole is the part that doesn't <coughs> touch the ground. So it's describing. Uh, Yani the curvature of the foot. So he wasn't flat footed. Someone who's flat footed, uh, the soles completely touch the ground, which is a which is a, a shortcoming or a deficiency. But the Prophet Sallallahu was his foot was arched so that his actually sole didn't touch the ground. But not too arched in a way that would be considered a deformity, but in a balanced way. Masih al Qadamaini Yambu Anhum al Ma these two go together. Nasir al Qadamaini means like a uh, sleek or soft texture to the skin of his foot. Yambu anhum al ma. So if water was poured on them, they would slide off due to the, the nature of the skin of the foot. So it wasn't coarse, it wasn't calloused, it wasn't anything like that, but quite the opposite. Ida zala zala qal'an. This we read in the previous hadith. Yahtu. So if he walked, so a purposeful walk, and the way he walked was purposeful, but it, there was hawn in it, right? And this is the description of the believers in the Quran. So al-mash here, hawnan, literally and figuratively. Literally, and that even though there was a purpose to the way he walked, but at the same time, uh, there was a humility to it. Haunan. There was an ease about it. It wouldn't make you nervous. It wouldn't make you scared. You know how you, if you walk in the street and you just see the way some people walk, it just makes you anxious or nervous. The Prophet wasn't anything like that. It wouldn't make you nervous. wouldn't make you anxious. It would make you want to see who that is. It would draw you to him. Is the type of walk. Uh, again, see the description of walk. There's hawn, there's dhari al mishya, which means with some speed, and then before, as if he's coming down the slope, 
but there's a purposefulness as if he's pulling something out of the ground so to put all those images all at once to try to picture them is not easy but that was part of the uniqueness of, of the Prophet Sallallahu that it can seem purposeful and it can seem gentle at the same time it can seem uh, rapid but humble at the same time so those are all seeming contradictions but when you put them into one person such as the person of the Prophet Sallallahu they are the epitome of balance and completeness and perfection and that's a difficult thing to do most people who work at any type of trade and you want to like build the uh, perfect car or build the perfect uh, uh, house it's all about keeping things in balance one with the next and that's one of the most difficult parts when, you, when you're building something like this but in the Prophet Sallallahu all things were balanced both his physical as well as his characteristic attributes were in perfect balance with each other there was no contradiction there was no uh, grading of one thing with the next as most of us have you know, there's always something where something is pulling us this way and something is pulling us that way and you know it kind of makes us a little bit out of balance but he was the epitome of balance and that's what we mean by deen al-wasat khayr al-umur awsatuha the best of matters are the awsat or the most balanced Right. Some people translate it as middle way, that's okay, but I think the word balanced is more applicable because we're talking about between two extremes. There's always two extremes. Too loose, too strict. Too fast, too slow. Too tall, too short. Too bright, too dark. But the balance between those two, that's when, when you reach to uh, a side of completion. So a completion and perfection is not to go to one extreme or the next. It's to maintain a balance between those two extremes. إذا مشى كأن الحق من صبب وإذا التفت التفت جميعا. We describe that. خاف الطرف نظره إلى الأرض أطول من نظره إلى السماء جل نظره الملاحظة. So here now he's getting into more of his characteristic attributes. Khafu the tarfi, his gaze will be more down, right? He kept a, a lower type of gaze. Nadaruhu ila al-ab, atwalu min nadarihi ila al-sama. His gaze towards the earth would be more than his gaze towards the heavens. Why? Because hawa mabruth ila al-ab. He is sent to the faqalain, to the jinn and the ins of the Ard. He wasn't sent as a messenger to the Mala'ika. He was sent as a messenger to the people on earth. So his area of concern is going to be the people of the earth. It doesn't mean, doesn't mean though that he didn't look to the skies. It just said more. But he did look to the skies. And the way that we, we know ourselves is by looking at those two things. And the way that we know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is by knowing ourselves. And the Quran reminds us of this. سَنُرِيهُمْ آيَاتِنَا فِي الْآفَاقِ وَفِي أَنفُسِهِمْ حَتَّى يَتَبَيَّنَ لَهُمْ أَنَّهُ الْحَقِّ سَنُرِيهِمْ We will show them, Allah SWT is speaking in the Quran, آيَاتِنَا فِي الْآفَاقِ Our signs in the آفَاق, in the horizons, وَفِي أَنفُسِهِمْ And in within themselves, حَتَّى يَتَبَيَّنَ لَهُمْ أَنَّهُ الْحَقِّ Until they discern that it's the truth. So how do you know yourself? Look to inside yourself. How do you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Knowing yourself. Man arafa rabbahu, man arafa nafsahu, arafa rabbah. Whoever knows himself knows Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yani, ta'araf nafsaka bil ajaz, wa ta'araf Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bil kamal. You know yourself with incapacity and inability, then you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has all the capability and has all the qudra and has all the adama and has all the hawl and all the quwa. And you know that you're the opposite of that. So knowing the true nature of yourself will give you an idea of the true nature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so these are between these two horizons, both the earth and, and the, the sama and the heavens, one can discern these things. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam more concerned with Al-Ard, because that's where he was sent. Jullu nazarihi al-murahada. Right? Here, nazar is talking about physical sight. So most of what he would notice, what he would look at, and mulahada would just be like a glimpse, 
glimpses because he's not concerned with everything that's going around here he's concerned with his mission he's concerned with his heart he's concerned with his lord and he's concerned with delivering that message from his lord to the people and so his nadara was not one of covetousness was not one of greed was not one of thinking do i have more than this person or do they have more than me do i have what they want do they ha do they want what i have none of these nadarat were part of him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They were part of us, but they weren't a part of him. So in mulahaba, yulahid, he takes a glimpse. He can see in as much as he needs to understand, to to maintain his da'wah, maintain his mission. But if it was not uh, pertinent to the da'wah, he had no interest in it. It was not interesting to him. He was only interested in that which, which is important. And uh, we live now in a world of complete distractions. Everything is a distraction. All around us are distractions. The phone, the TV, the internet, even uh, advertising. People are distractions. People nowadays are just talking advertisement. All they can talk back to you is what they read on TV or saw on the internet and they just talk it back. They don't have really anything interesting to say, most people. And that's the societies that we're living in now, whether it's here or anywhere, it's all the same. Um, and you, you, you have the opportunity here to bring something that people haven't really seen before or experienced. If we can only embody these meanings, if we can embody the legacy of the Prophet Sallallahu it will be something so interesting to people, something so unique, something that they didn't think was there, because all they're seeing are forms, all they're seeing are snippets, all they're seeing are people making claims, but not the essence of things. And you won't see the essence of things unless you're presented with it in a true form, a true state. But if just a form, surah, without an essence behind it, that's not attractive to anybody because the whole dunya is about that. The whole dunya is about forms. It's all about the wahir. Right? min hayat dunya They know about the wahir, all the ostensible things in the dunya, but the akhirah, the fish. Yasuku ashaba. Right? Because we have, uh, he didn't say yakudu ashaba, he said yasuku. So Yasuku means he walked behind them. If it said Yakudu Ashaba, it means he walks in front of them. So so Al Qaid is the one who leads from the front. Was Sa'iq is the one who leads from behind. So we should call drivers Qaid, not Sa'iq, because they're sitting in the front. Unless they put the steering wheel in the back and then they, then it becomes Sa'iq. So Yasuku Ashaba means that he was always behind them. Leading them, showing them, but leading them in a way uh, that there was also like a uh, a meaning of tarbiya, nurturing them. Because if you're leading from the front, you don't see what's going on behind you. You just expect people to fall in line. Just do what I do. You know, it's like you don't care what's going on behind you. But when you lead from the back, right, and they're in front of you, then you see what's going on, and you're actually you're doing tarbiyah, you're nurturing these souls, you're bringing them somewhere. And actually they're taking themselves. You're just giving them the push. You're showing them the way. But they're the ones who are taking themselves. Amr al-Qa'id from the front, he's leading them. They may follow, or they may not follow. They can step out of line and you will not even notice if they're still behind him or not. That's from one aspect. Another aspect, some of the hadith point that walking behind the Prophet ﷺ would be the angels themselves. So he would tell them, don't walk behind me because the angels are behind me. So walk in front of him. Allah Alam. And then finally, we have to man naqiya bis salam. He would be the first yubadir bis salam. Right? He wouldn't think about uh, you know, ish markazi wa maqami. Hal hawa yu'udu salam wa na'udu salam al awwal. La ana ala minu fil shirka mafud hawa yubadir bis salam. Ana mudiru. Hawa mafud salam ayyad awwal. He didn't say that. Right? There's no one ala in the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There's no one higher than him. But if you saw someone, you'd say, Assalamu Alaikum. Right? He would be the first to greet them. Ba'adin loves the salam. Right? He would say, Assalamu Alaikum. There is no better greeting than this. If people only knew. It's better than bonjour. It's better than good morning. It's better than uh, all the other stuff that people say around here. But Assalamu Alaikum. Ma fi ahla minha. Ma fi ahsa minha. There's nothing better than that. And in fact, when, when you start with the salam, you also give the opportunity for the person who's responding back to you to fulfill a wajib, right? Because fulfilling rad al-salam wajib, 
or follow the kifaya. So if you enter into a group, right, and there's a whole group, at least one of them should make the rad or the answering back of the salam. وَأَجْرُ الْفَرْضِ خَيْرٌ مِنْ أَجْرِ السُنَّةِ So الْمُبَادَرَ بِالسَّلَامِ سُنَّةِ Staying the salam outright to begin with, that's sunnah or mustahab. And then uh, answering it is fard kifaya. So you give people the opportunity to get even a greater reward than you did for actually saying it to begin with. So, and if that was the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the best of creation, not just the best human being, the best of creation, period. And he would be the one to start the salam. So who are we to wait for someone else or to see what relative position we have with them and so forth before we decide or think about whether we should say salam alaikum to them. Yani can you salam hatta his salam was so beautiful can tell ahjab salam alaikum. The rocks would give him salam, the animals would give him salam. There's nowhere that he walked except things would give their salam to him. Trees would bend towards him when he would walk. Hada can salam So I think uh we read two hadith, but still, they were good. Alhamdulillah, we were able to get through them. So we'll stop here, inshallah, unless someone has any uh, questions, comments. Um, he was aware of their presence. When he was returning from Ta'if and then he was on his way back to Mecca, he ran into some of the jinn and that's where Surat al-Jinn was revealed uh, in that place. And there used to be a mosque called the Masjid al-Jinn. I'm not sure if it's still there with the current authorities in Saudi Arabia just plowing everything. I'm not sure if it's remains, but I remember visiting it once. Masjid al-Jinn. So what is it? Huh? Why, why is it called that? This is the place where some of the jinn was revealed and the Prophet Sallallahu spoke to the jinn on his way back from from Ba'if. And obviously you can see the angels when they saw him. Um, jinn sometimes can reveal themselves in forms that people can see. But it's not something that you would try to do, usually. As I, I say always to people, the, the, the good jinn don't want to have anything to do with us. And the good believers don't want anything to do with them either. We don't, we're not interested in in, uh, in crossing that realm, that dimension, and, and uh, having a relationship. So it's only the bad from them and the bad from us that get together. There have been different in, 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 uh, in tafsir about what's the difference between hawl and quwwah. Probably the better ones that I've heard is uh, hawl is because when you, when you have qudra to do something, you can either actually execute it or you have the ability in yourself and you don't do it. What's the potential to do something? But hawl is the potential. So no one really even has a potential to do something except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the actual executable, yani al quwwa tanfidhiyya, also is only with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So al quwwa al suluhiyya, yani huwa yuslah an yaf'al, an yaqdir, an ya'mal, hadha lillahi wahda. Wa kathalik al quwwa tanfidhiyya, hadha lillahi wahda wa kathalik. So la hawla wa la quwwa. Al hawl, hatta the ability, and ana amal haga, it's not really with me, it's with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How is potential ability? Not executed. Am al quwa mumkin and the tenfees or 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 tenfees nafsu. Which hawl is the hawl? La it tama nafs al kalima but in ma'na mukhtalifi. Nafs al ma'na. Hala yahul. Hawlan. Yani hala yahul hawlan also means to get in between something. From the same word you get muhal, which means impossible. So it's like a force, yani masdur quwa. Uh, but in this context, la hawla wa la quwa, yani quwa lam tunafaz ba. Wa amma al quwa nafsaha, qabla tanfid. Allah alam. Fi tafasir taniya, Allah alam.
يعني ربما هذه المناسبة is beyond any of our imagination or comprehension. Why? Because all that we can possibly imagine would be things we have already come into contact with. So, for example, um, a cow can't fly. Right? Cows don't fly. But I can imagine such a thing. I can picture it in my head. Why? Because I've seen other things fly, like birds, and maybe in a movie somewhere they made a cow fly. So the picture, surah, of a cow flying, I can imagine that. But whatever we try to do, we can never imagine Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. His that, his essence, we can't imagine it. Why? Because it's unlike anything that we've experienced. We've never come into contact with anything, and we never will. So it's unimaginable. That's the beginning of, of ma'rifah, so to speak. Of knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is knowing that you can't know him. That's what Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq said. Al Ajru an al Idraki Idraq. Yani uh, admitting to yourself that you can't know him in that way, that's the beginning of knowing him. The ulama of of uh, of Aqidah when they first describe some of the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they start with the Sifat al Salbiya. Usually, sifat al-salbiya means those things that are negative attributes. Yani saying everything that Allah is not. So, he is uh, he is batin, right? He is will be uh, forever, never ends. We can't really imagine that because we never come into contact with anything that never ends. Everything that we know of our experience has a beginning and has an end. So. <coughs> Rationally, intellectually, you can tell me something, this thing will never end, but to really Im imbibe that meaning, you have to go beyond the rational to really, really live that and understand that. But that's the beginning. Mukhalafati uh, al-Hawadith. He's not like anything else. Okay, that makes sense. But how? How is that possible? Again, it's something that's difficult to comprehend when you actually try to picture it. So the way that you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is via his signs. His ayah, and there are many. That's why the ayah, a verse in the Quran, is called a verse or a sign because it's a sign that leads you, shows you towards Him. But there are also ayat, like we said in the verse, fil afaq wa fi anfusihim. There are signs to discern in the dunya itself. The whole dunya is a sign. The whole dunya, everything in it, the all of creation, that's all signs in it. It's all there for us to figure out who Allah Subhanahu wa Taala actually is. And even our own selves, وَفِي أَنفُسِهِمْ Even within our own selves, for those who can't see the signs out, see the signs in. There are signs to know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one. And namely, you, the, the main sign that you see both in the afaq and in yourselves is imperfection. In the sense that, or incapability. You're not capable of doing this and doing that. And no matter how much I do, uh, the outcome is never guaranteed. That's ajaz. That's incapability. Right? You can't say you're really capable of something if you don't know if the outcome is going to turn out your way or not. No one can be certain. You can put a certain amount of energy or time and money and resources on a particular thing, but can you guarantee the outcome? Right? The, the, the soccer team, football team can train for years and weeks and months for the tournament, but can anyone guarantee they'll win? They cannot. Because the outcome is not in their hands. So when you begin to see and actually live la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah, right? Not just the, the beginning is to say it, right? Because we believe there's, there's a, 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 an intricate connection between what the tongue says and the effect it has on its heart. And so when you start saying it enough, then that will have that effect on the heart. Until the heart starts beating with that meaning. And then when that happens, it's not your tongue saying it, it's your heart wanting you to say it. So here the driver is not the tongue anymore, it's your heart driving you, telling the tongue what to say. And this is what Imam al-Ghazali's description of how 
one can go from one level of dhikr, which is the dhikr of the tongue, and then you go to the next level, which is the dhikr of the heart, and then the final level, uh, which is complete fanat or complete um, annihilation into only the madhkur. So it's not even dhikr of the tongue and the heart anymore, everything is about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Which again, it's a description. Unless you've actually tasted and lived that, it's very difficult to... I couldn't describe it to you because I don't, I'm not there. But those people who, who've, who've lived that, they know what, what, what this means. So, uh, yeah, we could spend hours talking about, about that. Whole books and volumes have been written about uh, knowing yourself and then knowing y your Lord. Bejuri, he, he says in this commentary that there's a secret in studying his physical attributes that may not be, I'm saying, that may not be discernible to everybody. Uh, so some people you're reading, okay, his arms were of this length and he had hair here, then have hair there. <coughs> and, but these people recorded it for a reason, right? They wouldn't have not recorded it unless it meant something, unless there was a meaning behind it. And Someone who, yeah, I mean, it goes back to the meaning of mahabbat. Some, if you truly love something, you want to know everything about it, right? Someone, you know, nowadays people, if they find like a friend or fiance or you know husband or wife that they want to marry, they're in love with, they go on Google and they search for them and they find everything about them. They want to find all the images and who the friends are and where they've been and kada. Why? Because this is ishq al mahbub. They're in in love with the, the object, the beloved themselves, so they want to know everything. So there are ushaq, right, ashiqeen who want to know everything about the Prophet ﷺ. So when they read things like this, it's like, wow, that too, and kada, and you know, that meaning is even built up more in their hearts because now they're getting to know the object of, of that love. We're not reading it just about a man that lived in some historical figure. وَعَلَمُوا إِنَّ فِيكُمْ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ الآن, He is with you now, not something... I wouldn't. I don't even like saying historical figure. I mean, Hadai Ali doesn't give him his right when we say that, because his his worldly death may have happened, but he's still alive, right? He's still alive in his grave, and he's to be alive in our hearts. The meaning, his legacy, is still alive, and it's no coincidence that the last hadith in this book talks about seeing the Prophet ﷺ in a dream. Right? مَنْ رَآنِي فَقَدْ رَآنِي فَإِنَّ الشَّيْطَانَ لَا يَتَنَفِّلُ بِي Whoever sees me has seen me. Because the shaytan cannot take my form in a dream. And many are the people who have read uh, Shema'il or have really imbibed the meaning of the Shema'il and after that they see the Prophet not just once but many times in their dreams. And that means if you actually see him, you've seen him. He's come to you. For, you, for him to come to you is a meaning, there's a ma'na. He doesn't come to everybody. It only comes to those people who love him and whom he loves. Um, and so if we want to build up the meaning of love within ourselves for him, then we want to know everything about him. We want to know his surah, his actions, his attributes. We want to know all the manifestations of perfection, even in his physical attributes that the companions and the tabi'in and all the scholars of hadith, they brought to us after. Because it's uh, without it, how can we know him? We have a, a, a golden opportunity to know everything about him. We don't have this detailed description of Al Messiah alayhi salam. Jesus. You know what the best description of Jesus is? Whose description? His description. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. In the hadith we're going to read next, he describes he looks like this particular Sahabi that is with us. Because he saw him. Layat al Isra' wal Ma'raj, the night of ascension, when he went to uh, uh, Jerusalem and prayed and led all 124,000 prophets who've ever come in prayer on the the Fil Aqsa and then he went to the heavens and he also met some of those same prophets in the heavens he saw all of them, he knows what they look like so he described them, he described Ibn Musa he described Ibrahim he described uh, uh, Isa, Jesus alayhi salam 
but we don't have a complete description as we do except for him so we should take advantage of all that that's, that's there even in the seer all of the seer that have been written you know we know his activities where he went the people he met how he spoke to them so it's a it's a it's a it's a ni'mah that we're, we're not we don't really realize the the blessing the, the realize the size of it unless you begin to delve into it we should be spending more time on it and if we spend all our time on it we wouldn't be wasting our time طيب جزاكم الله خير نسأل الله سبحانه وتعالى أن يوفقنا ويهدينا وأن يزدنا في طاعته وأن يعنى على ذكره وشكره وحسن عبادته وأن يفرج عن المسلمين في كل مكان في سوريا وفي ليبيا وفي تونس وفي فلسطين وفي بورما وفي أفغانستان وفي باكستان وفي سائر بلدان المسلمين وأن يوفق بيننا وبين أهل الخير الخير وأن يصلح بيننا وبين إخواننا وأن يصلح بين أبناءنا وأبناء هذا الوطن وأن يلهم ولاة أمورنا إلى الطاعة وإلى الخير وإلى ما هو في صالح العباد والبلاد وأن يلحقنا بالصالحين وافتح لنا فتوح العارفين وأن يخرجنا من دائرة سخطه إلى دائرة الرضا وأن يجعل آخر كلمة في الدنيا لا إله إلا الله محمد رسول الله حسا ومعنى ظاهر وباطن ومحاضة النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم الفاتحة